Hey, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine. We are coming to you live from Arlington, Virginia, and uh, we'll wait a minute or two for uh, our friends to come on and, uh, and say hello. Uh, and uh, while we're waiting, I'll tell you a little bit about another one of our good friends. That's uh, Mike Medhurst. You uh, know him from Mike Med or Medhurst and Company fine images and documents. Uh, Mike is one of the finest dealers, most reputable dealers that are out there. Um, I'm proud to say that he is a uh, longtime advertiser in Military Images Magazine, and uh, he's been absolutely a terrific partner uh, with the magazine and for the photo collecting community. I see Don Weinstock has joined us. Hey, or pardon me, Dan Weinstock. Hey, Dan. Uh, Michael Pissarro is here. How's it going, Michael? Uh, glad to have you both on board tonight. See, other folks are coming on. Uh, Gene, <laughs> yes, you made it on time. Very excited uh, to have you uh, with us tonight, as always. And uh, so um, uh, while more folks are coming on board, um, uh, I'll mention to you, go visit Mike Medhurst. He updates his site regularly, always says something new and exciting, whether you're collecting Civil War images, uh, civilian images, uh, Mike has a wide selection for you to choose from. So go check him out. Uh, Jeff Jambrone is here, Rick uh, Wolf is here, uh, Carol Coddington, mom, is here. Uh, so we have uh, mom got over her uh, troubles. They had some uh, bad weather down there in North Carolina. Uh, internet access must be back. Uh, glad everybody is safe down there. Also, uh, I hope all of you are staying safe and well and continuing to hunker down while we're in the middle of uh, this coronavirus crisis. Um, we're hoping that the curve is flattened and um, we uh, express our uh, sorrow and sympathies to all the families of those who lost uh, loved ones um, during this crisis. And um, our thoughts and prayers go out to all of them. And uh, I hope that it serves as a reminder for us to do our part to, uh, to keep safe and keep healthy and keep on social distancing. So um, as you know, during this uh, crisis, we started up a new series. This is through the Civil War Photo Collector Society, uh, Civil War Faces and Military Images. It's a partnership called Caretakers. Uh, I recommend that you go onto Civil War Faces. Uh, that's Doug York's Facebook page. Um, that's where the videos are hosted. You can also see all the videos on our YouTube channel. That's Military Images YouTube channel. Uh, the latest caretaker to talk about his collection is Rich Jan. Uh, Rich came on last Saturday and shared just an incredible array from his images. More importantly, he also shared his passion for Civil War collecting. I also want to do a shout out to Rich's daughter, Erin, uh, who you did not see, but she was more or less the executive producer. Uh, she uh, helped coordinate, move the camera, and do all that good stuff uh, behind the scenes. So a big thanks to Erin for helping out her dad to showcase his wonderful collection. So, um, a lot more folks coming on now. Uh, we'll keep on going. Um, let me see here. Oh, gosh. August Marchetti, uh, Lisa Smith, Ridgeway, Virginia. Um, other folks uh, coming on. So, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to start out tonight um, with uh, a segment called She Answered the Call. And uh, as you know, the last couple episodes, I've talked a little bit about nurses, and uh, it seems appropriate um, considering the current state of the country and the current state of the world to think about those who have, uh, those who are on the front lines, uh, the nurses and the doctors. And, uh, and so in this case, we're gonna dig back, dig deep into the Mollus uh, archives at Carlisle Barracks. And um, 
uh, if you go and dig around uh, far enough, you'll find uh, this photograph in one of the mollusk scrapbooks. And uh, this is Lucina Meacham. And uh, if you are uh, someone who follows Doug York and you know about pips or photos and photos, you'll notice what she's holding down here in her hand. Uh, it is a photo album. And um, I'm going to take a guess here and say that uh, it is perhaps a photograph of her. Um, I see what appears to be a woman who looks very much like her, although it's difficult to make out the detail, and what may be a couple of men. Uh, these three are quite entangled together during the war uh, because Lucina had two sons. Let me get Lucina back here for you. <clears throat> Lucina had two sons that went off to war in 1861, uh, and uh, they're Oscar and Levi. Now, uh, you should know a little bit about Lucina, uh, and I'll tell you, these are her two surviving sons. She uh, comes from New England stock and moved to Ohio to Parma Township at some point during her young life and uh, settled there with her parents. Uh, young life was difficult for her. Two marriages, two husbands that she buried. Uh, a daughter um, who died. I believe all three of them died of disease. Uh, far too young uh, and didn't live long enough to see, um, see their later years. So Lucina was left alone raising two sons, uh, and that's uh, Oscar and Levi. Um, in Parma Township, Ohio. When the Civil War began, her two sons enlisted in the 67th Ohio Infantry. And uh, in January of 62, uh, the regiment, after it had its training, um, is called to the East to serve in uh, Virginia, Washington, D.C., that main Eastern theater of the war. So uh, around that time, a little bit before uh, the regiment goes off, they experience their first enemy. That first enemy is disease. And um, uh, there's a call that comes out uh, to Ohio um, by the regiment. Uh, they beseech the regiment, or pardon me, they beseech the town people to send help to take care for all these sick boys in the ranks, suffering the childhood diseases for the most part. And so here, uh, Lucina who is a, uh, she's a strong woman of faith. She's a Baptist, and uh, she's described as a gentle, benevolent uh, soul. She likes singing the Gospels for entertainment. And uh, Lucina uh, does something uh, that is maybe unexpected for uh, those who knew her. Uh, she packs her bags when the word comes in, and uh, she goes down south and finds them in their camp and uh, she helps nurse all the boys and her sons uh, as best as she can under the circumstances. When the regiment goes off, uh, goes to the east, she goes with them. And uh, while the regiment is getting settled in Virginia, uh, she goes to Washington and uh, visits with Dorothea Dix, who many of you know as the superintendent of nurses in Washington. And uh, Dorothea Dix gives her a job as a nurse. While she's waiting to get her assignment, the boys in the 67th are called to fight in the Peninsula Campaign. Lucina gets a little bit impatient and uh, no assignments coming in. So she goes down to Virginia and joins the boys and uh, winds up nursing uh, some of the sick soldiers, and probably some of the wounded during the campaign. She ultimately gets an assignment in Baltimore. She becomes separated from her sons at that point. She's in Baltimore, she's in Annapolis, and uh, she serves a couple of years uh, and some months as a nurse, and uh, she sees her share of casualties, both in sick and injured. Meanwhile, her sons are fighting, uh, one of them gets discharged early, 1862. Uh, the other son is wounded twice uh, at Fort Wagner in South Carolina 
and later on during the peninsula, or pardon me, during the Petersburg campaign in 64. He winds up uh, mustering out in June of 1865. It's about the same time that Lucina musters out of the nurses corps. So she put in close to a good three and a half years uh, serving as a nurse while her sons were soldiers. So uh, Lucinda's story has a, a bit of a happy ending. Um, she does find love for a third time and she marries. Uh, unfortunately, that marriage ends 11 years later after her husband dies. And uh, she lives on though. She lives on to 1895, uh, dying at age 74. And so um, a tribute to Lucinda Meacham, who packed her bags, went down south and followed her boys, nursed them back to health, nursed a regiment, the 67th Ohio, back to health, went to the east with them, and stayed there for the rest of the war. So a tip of the cap to Lucina. Now, here's one for, for the collectors. Uh, this segment is the $35 CDV, 1928. Uh, I talk a lot about collecting and the collecting community, and I oftentimes ground, or my starting point, my grounding point, is uh, usually the, as Ross Kelbaugh likes to say, the centennial generation. Um, those guys and men and women who started collecting back in the in the 60s and uh, the time period before that gets a little bit hazy i found a couple of stories here and there about uh, early collectors and um, uh, i've got a new one that i'm going to add to the list i should tell you guys this is all this is uh, what i'm showing you what i'll be showing you tonight for the rest of the show this is all stuff that's a work in progress so if you have ideas and thoughts or know something, um, please uh, share it. So here's the image, uh, which is um, Augustus Woodbury, a chaplain, uh, second Rhode Island infantry. He's in that group that came down for three months uh, in uh, 1861 from Rhode Island to Washington. Uh, the big name you know is uh, Ambrose Everett. Burnside. Um, he's the colonel uh, of the Rhode Islanders. And uh, Woodbury is a Unitarian minister. Uh, he's a prolific writer, sermons, and then books. Uh, one of the books he writes is uh, about uh, a regimental history of the three months that they spent uh, in 1861. He publishes the regimental history in 1862, just a year, uh, less than a year after um, their three month tour ends. This photograph is, um, uh, is him wearing his Burnside blouse, the classic um, pleated blouse with the buttons uh, down the single breasted buttons going down the front of his coat. Uh, very nice pose. Uh, you don't see it reproduced very often. What's on the back is what really caught my attention as much as the, the actual image. On the back uh, is his name, uh, Reverend A. Woodbury, chaplain at Bull Run, first Bull Run, perfectly matches, and there's photographs to confirm that this is him. But what's under it, uh, it really caught my attention. Um, it's written in, it uh, looks like a, uh, in, uh, a black ink pen that definitely has that feel of the early 20th century. You can tell by the, the sort of the viscosity of the ink. Uh, it's quite, uh, just has a certain period feel about it. And um, at the top, it says Reverend A.W. Woodbury, chaplain at Bull Run, which is an, a repeat of what is written in pencil above it. And um, it almost looks like it was written twice, once in pencil, and then whoever um, uh, at some point uh, rewrote it in pen. I'm not quite sure why. Um, the person who wrote the pen, or wrote, made this penmanship, um, also wrote at the bottom, gift of Mr. of Mrs. John M. Uh, McGann, 30 March, 1928. Also written in pen 
is what appears to be the price, $35. Now, was that the price that was paid for the carte de visite? I don't know, but the ink and the penmanship is an, it seems like an exact match. It all feels very period. It's easy to imagine, imagine it's from 1928. So uh, do we have a, a $35 carte de visite that dates from 1928? Did someone pay um, $35 for this as a gift? Was a part of a package of relics, maybe books, uh, maybe some other related objects, personal objects to Reverend Woodbury? I don't know, um, but it is curious that that uh, dollar figure would be written on the back. If so, and when you think about it in context, uh, when you realize that in the 19, early 60s, some of those images were being, some of these images were being given away for free, and then later they cost a dollar, two dollars, four dollars. Uh, this is a really expensive um, image for the time. So, interesting story. Next segment, the sitting, the picture, and the double header. This starts off, gosh, I guess probably last year or so, uh, with uh, Cara Lee Stewart. Some of you may know Cara. She uh, works over at the Horse Soldier in Gettysburg. Uh, last time I saw her in person was uh, over at the uh, Franklin Show, where she was representing the Horse Soldier, and uh, we had a nice chat. Uh, the summer previous, I had gone over um, and met with her to scan a couple of images. And about that time, she told me about an album that uh, was in the shop. It wasn't out for sale. I believe it was in the back of the shop. And uh, it was a, a unique scrapbook that she told me about. And uh, she was really interested in some of the sketches that were in the scrapbook. Uh, and this is is the page that she sent me, the one that she was thinking of. And uh, uh, I'll show you a close up of these two images. They're actually portraits, self portraits of a soldier. And um, the soldier's name is Stanton Allen, who actually ran away from home uh, when he was, I don't know, 16 years old, I think, and uh, joined the 21st Cavalry. Or at least he tried to until his father uh, caught him and dragged him back home. Not long after, he ran away with a friend, uh, Irving Waterman, and uh, was successful. Crossed over into Massachusetts and uh, joined the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry. So uh, he did these two sketches. Uh, one of them here is called The Sitting. And so you know right away what we're talking about here. This is his sitting for a photograph, and uh, he's got a big old revolver stuck into his, uh, his coat. Uh, he's got sort of a smile on his face, and you can see he signed it with uh, his initials SPA for Stanton P. Allen. It's another one that's signed by him. This is the one that's next to it in the, in the, in the page in the album. Um, this is called uh, The Picture, a Double Header. And uh, if you look closely, what Stanton is trying to show us here, he's trying to describe, is um, uh, if you're out of focus, if you shake a little bit during the exposure time, this is what you're gonna get. Um, you're gonna get this little um, shaking going on and the camera's gonna catch it. So Stanton's having a little bit of fun with us here and showing us these portraits of the successful image and the less successful image. So um, uh, the words on the scrapbook page, if you start to look around, it's pretty easy to find uh, that they appeared in the book that he wrote uh, called Down in Dixie. And uh, it's a great volume. Some of you may be familiar with it. He writes about his experiences. It sort of has a little bit of a, a Company H uh, kind of feel. This is the everyman soldier who's in the trenches uh, doing this thing. And uh, Stanton has a little bit of fun. If you look around a little bit more online, 
you start to find out that uh, our good friends at the Center for Civil War Photography uh, did a little bit of work and uh, William Griffin's collection has uh, this wonderful uh, sketch also done by Alan of, uh, um, it looks like it could be another self-portrait of him. He's standing uh, with the backdrop. Uh, that's probably his friend Irving Waterman in the background peeping behind the backdrop. There's the camera operator behind the lens of the camera. Uh, great, great pose. And then of course, uh, also from Center of Civil War Photography, um, here's a tintype. Uh, and you've got uh, Stanton on the right, you have uh, Irving Waterman on the left, and then here's a picture of uh, Stanton in uh, an older age. So um, what's really quite nice about this, and I'm going to take you back, uh, we'll go back to this image here. I'll read you just a little bit, just to give you a sense, uh, because for those of you who, like me, are really fascinated about what it was like to um, be in the studio, and what that experience was like. Um, no one, no one really describes it uh, quite as well as uh, Stanton. So let me give you a little bit of a, just a little bit of a, a taste of this. Um, Irving's mother, Mrs. Waterman, uh, is sort of the driving force behind this first passage. And uh, the quote is, Mrs. Waterman asked Irving, that's her son, and myself to have our pictures taken. Neither of us had ever been photographed or tintyped, but we took kindly to the idea. We sat together, and the picture, a tintype, was pronounced an excellent likeness. What a trying performance it was, though. We were all braced up with an iron rest back of the head and told, look about there, you can wink, but don't move. Of course, the tintype presented the subject as one appears in a mirror. The right hand was left and the buttons are on the wrong side in the picture, but Mrs. Waterman declared the tintype to be as near like them as two peas, and we accepted her verdict. The dear old lady has kept that picture for all these years. Now, for those of you who think about that whole reversal effect and uh, know what the soldiers did. Here's a first-hand account of this. Uh, the book says, Stanton says, the soldier boys resorted to all sorts of expedients to beat the machine. Of course, beating the machine is the camera. That is, to so arrange their arms and accoutrements that when a tintype was taken, it would not be upside down or wrong end to. To this end, the saber belt would be put on wrong side up so that the scabbard would hang on the right side. That would bring it on the left side where it belonged in the picture. He goes on and talks about the trouble that they went to to get these, uh, get their belts backwards, get their sabers on the other side. Uh, they're all very proud of what they've been able to do to have this convincing looking photograph made so they could beat the machine. Now, of course, one of the veteran soldiers, uh, oh, uh, looks at this um, uh, photograph where uh, Stanton was trying to imitate the uh, uh, parade rest um, command. And so a veteran soldier says, hey, it's all very fine for a recruit to pose that way, but a soldier wouldn't hold his saber with his left hand and put his right hand over it at parade rest. So here he is being critiqued by a veteran soldier um, after his first photograph. And uh, he says, sure enough, I had forgotten the hands, but recruits were not supposed to know everything from the start. So it goes on and on and on. There's some great tidbits uh, of information in here. And uh, one more tidbit that, uh, actually two tidbits that I want to share with you. Um, one of them is, uh, the difference between the, sort of the tin types versus the carte de visite. Uh, Stan says, we had photographs taken as well as tin types. And by photographs, he means carte de visite, albumin, the paper photographs. But he says, the art of photography has greatly improved since the war. Remember, he's writing decades after the war at this point. Most of the photographs of that day that I have seen of late are badly faded and 
it is next to impossible to have a good copy made. Not so with the tintypes. They remain unfaded and excellent photographic copies can be secured. In many a home today, hang the pictures of a soldier boy, some of them life-sized portraits copied from tintypes taken in the days of the war. I love this passage because what he's telling us is these images that we hold so dear were very precious to the families uh, after the war, long after the war. Here we are probably in the 1880s, 1890s, and uh, these images of the soldier boys are still holding a prominent place in the family. Last little tidbit uh, about this. Uh, another quote, he says, um, I know where and where homes are where the gray-haired mothers still cling to the little tintype picture. The only likeness they have of a darling boy who is offered as a sacrifice for liberty. How tenderly the picture is handled, how sacredly the mother has preserved it. These mothers often say, I shall meet my boy again in heaven, and there shall be no more separation, no more cruel rebellions. So, there you have it, the story of Stanton Allen and uh, his commentary on the trials and tribulations of having a photograph made. So, I think we're going to end here for tonight. Uh, I do have a research, uh, um, research rabbit hole. There's no way that I can get it in in the time we have remaining. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll come back at you in a couple weeks uh, with a new episode and um, we'll go down the research rabbit hole and elsewhere. And uh, I want to wish all of you a great night. I really appreciate you listening, tuning in, and uh, happy hunting. Happy research. Stay safe. Stay well. Have a great night. Bye.